So I hope you can begin to see from this excerpt what I mean by Krishnamurti in context. It's a little bit like observing an animal in its natural habitat instead of isolated in a laboratory setting. Now, most of the action of this book revolves around the people and the issues involved with the Oak Grove School, but Krishnamurti in context includes a larger field of vision. The book includes descriptions of people uh, who are not involved in the school, but were also very important in his life. Among these are his brother, Nitya, with whom he first came to Ojai in 1922, the uh, revolutionary author, speaker, and social activist, Annie Besant, who raised and nurtured Krishnamurti from the age of 14, uh, Aldous Huxley, author of Brave New World and many other books, uh, who became close friends with Krishnamurti during World War II, and, of course, the physicist David Bohm, who was probably Krishnamurti's closest collaborator throughout his lifetime. And Bohm's connection with Krishnamurti was so important that my book devotes an entire chapter to describing their relationship. The collaboration between these two men is one of the most fascinating stories, I think, of 20th century intellectual history. If we consider the major innovators in all of intellectual history. Collaboration is the exception, not the norm. Copernicus, Da Vinci, Galileo, Newton, Shakespeare, Mozart, Einstein, most of those whom we consider to represent the quality of genius were individuals who broke new ground without a traveling companion. A few prominent exceptions spring to mind. We might think of Watson and Crick, Russell and Whitehead, uh, Freud and Jung for a time, and we might even include a pair like um, Rogers and Hammerstein. But these exceptions are notable precisely for their infrequency of occurrence. And within that small set of collaborations among men of genius, the case of Krishnamurti and David Bohm may be the most extraordinary. Watson and Crick were both biologists, Russell and Whitehead both philosophers, Freud and Jung both in the psychological field. But David Bohm was first and foremost a quantum theoretical physicist, whereas Krishnamurti represented a blend of philosopher and psychologist with a spiritual or metaphysical background. How did these two men get together? What did they find they had in common? What did they talk about? What did their collaboration produce? Well, David Bohm began his graduate studies at Caltech in 1939, but he was not happy with the rather dry intellectual climate in the physics department there. He transferred the next year to Berkeley, where the nation's leading light in theoretical physics J. Robert Oppenheimer was head of the department. Oppenheimer was not only brilliant as a physicist, but also very cultured in the arts, languages, and Eastern philosophy. Bohm found a secure place among the graduate students there, many of whom, like Oppenheimer himself, were sympathetic toward the communist ideal of a classless, fully cooperative society. In those days, the theoretical position articulated by Karl Marx was not yet associated with totalitarianism or the absence of freedom, as it is today. On the contrary, Marx envisioned the withering away of the state, you know, uh, a proposition that might find a, a favorable place in conservative circles today. In any case, Oppenheimer was married to a woman who had close friends in the Communist Party, uh, his younger brother, Frank, was a member of the Communist Party, and Oppenheimer himself was sympathetic toward many elements of communist ideology, so it's no surprise that a similar current of thinking uh, was prevalent among several of Oppenheimer's uh, graduate students, including David Bohm. Now, Bohm's youthful predisposition uh, might have been of no consequence except for the fact that Oppenheimer was selected to head up the Manhattan Project, 
the United States effort to build an atomic bomb during World War II. And since Oppenheimer was known to have communist sympathies, he was placed under surveillance by the FBI. In fact, many of Oppenheimer's graduate students at Berkeley, including David Bohm, were placed under FBI surveillance in 1942 and 1943. Now, by 1950, Bohm was a well-established and popular professor uh, at Princeton University. He'd been there for four years, and he'd formed a close friendship with Albert Einstein and had contact with many of the world's top physicists. But then, Bohm was called to testify before the House Committee on Un-American Activities about his friends in the graduate department at Berkeley several years earlier. One of the people on the panel that interrogated Bohm was the young Richard Nixon. Bohm refused to answer some of the questions on grounds of principle as well as the Constitution. As a direct result, the president of Princeton University, a devout anti-communist, refused to renew Bohm's contract. The political atmosphere was so poisoned that he did not think he could get another job in the United States so Einstein wrote a letter of recommendation for Bohm to a university in Brazil, and he took a position there. And then later he moved to England and worked at Birkbeck College at the University of London for the remainder of his life. Now at the same time as he was under fire for his political sympathies, Bohm was making a fundamental contribution to the theoretical edifice of modern physics. Quantum physics deals with events at the subatomic level, inside the structure of the atom, or what I like to call the land of the electron. Now, the nature of things in the land of the electron is very different from ordinary reality as we know it. There are several characteristics that are very puzzling and difficult to understand, but I'd like to focus on just one of these. In all other areas of physics, and really in all other fields of science, we look for explanations of events by trying to understand what causes something to occur. To understand what causes what is generally considered the essence of what science is all about. But in the land of the electron, scientists had come to the very strange conclusion that causation itself is absent. The behavior of the electron is not caused by anything. All we can tell about how an electron is going to move or behave is to give a range of probabilities. It might do this, it might do that. But the movement of the electron is fundamentally random, strictly a matter of chance. It is not caused or determined by anything whatsoever. Now this interpretation of quantum reality is known as the Copenhagen interpretation because it was developed primarily by the physicist Niels Bohr who was uh, based in Copenhagen. And by 1950 the Copenhagen interpretation was considered settled doctrine in modern theoretical physics. It was thoroughly endorsed by Oppenheimer and almost all the top physicists of the day subscribed to this point of view. In fact, there was even a mathematical proof by the, created by the mathematician John von Neumann uh, that demonstrated that no other interpretation of events in the land of the electron was even logically possible. The only eminent physicist who was skeptical of the Copenhagen interpretation was Einstein. The idea that what happens in the land of the electron occurs strictly at random, rubbed him the wrong way, and prompted Einstein to make his famous statement, God does not play dice with the universe. But this was just an intuitive feeling on his part. Even Einstein was not able to show in a rigorous mathematical way that the Copenhagen interpretation was not the last word in quantum physics. Now Bohm was deeply familiar with the logic of the Copenhagen interpretation. He even wrote a textbook, Quantum Theory, which is still in print today and which explained the Copenhagen interpretation more thoroughly and more lucidly than anyone had done before. Nevertheless, he was not satisfied with this picture of reality. 
And so in 1951, he wrote a pair of papers demonstrating that causation, causality, was not necessarily absent from the land of the electron. It was, in fact, possible to interpret all the phenomena known to occur at the subatomic level in such a way as to admit that the electron's behavior could be the result of causes not yet apparent to science. To achieve this breakthrough, Bohm had to refute the mathematical proof that had been given by von Neumann, and he succeeded in doing exactly that. Now this was a fundamental, even a revolutionary development in the foundations of quantum physics. But the top physicists of the day were very attached to the prevailing Copenhagen interpretation, and they refused to acknowledge Bohm's contribution. Their attitude was summed up in a profoundly anti-scientific statement made by Oppenheimer himself. Oppenheimer said, if we cannot disprove Bohm, then we must agree to ignore him. <laughs> if we cannot disprove Bohm, then we must agree to ignore him. Well, here we are, some 60 years later, and Bohm's contribution has still not been disproved. In fact, it is gaining more and more adherence. Scientific American ran a cover story in 1994 on alternative interpretations of the quantum theory, and Bohm's view was spotlighted as preeminent among them. And one of the best measures of the success of a scientific paper is the number of times it is cited in papers by other scientists. And if you chart the decades from the 50s through the 90s and into 2000, each decade, the number of citations of Bohm's papers is greater than what it was in the preceding decade. In fact, his papers had about 10 times the number of citations in the 1990s as there were in the 1950s. And the highest peak occurred in the year 2000. 80 citations of his papers in that one year alone. Now, Bohm's papers just opened the door for the possibility of causation to exist in the land of the electron. But if science ever discovers that the behavior of the electron is in fact caused by something not yet known, then Bohm will probably be recognized as one of the three or four most brilliant physicists of the 20th century.